The Celestial Railroad by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Not a great while ago, passing through the gate of dreams, I visited that region of earth in which lies the famous city of destruction. It interested me much to learn that by the public spirit of some of the inhabitants, a railroad has recently been established between this populous and flourishing town and the celestial city. Having a little time upon my hands, I resolved to gratify a liberal curiosity to make a trip thither. Accordingly, one fine morning after paying my bill at the hotel, and directing the porter to stow my luggage behind a coach, I took my seat in the vehicle and set out for the station house. It was my good fortune to enjoy the company of a gentleman, one Mr. Smooth It Away, who, though he had never actually visited the celestial city, yet seemed as well acquainted with its laws, customs, policy, and statistics as with those of the city of destruction, of which he was a native townsman. Being, moreover, a director of the railroad corporation and one of its largest stockholders, he had in it his power to give me all desirable information respecting that praiseworthy enterprise. Our coach rattled out of the city, and at a short distance from its outskirts passed over a bridge of elegant construction, but somewhat too slight, as I imagined, to sustain any considerable weight. On both sides lay an extensive quagmire, which could not have been more disagreeable either to sight or smell, had all the kennels of the earth emptied their pollution there. Well, this, remarked Mr. Smoothed away, is the famous slough of despond, a disgrace to all the neighborhood, and the greater that it might be so easily converted into firm ground. I have understood, said I, that efforts have been made for that purpose from time immemorial. Bunyan mentions that above twenty thousand cartloads of wholesome instructions have been thrown in here without effect. Very probably. "'And what effect could be anticipated from such unsubstantial stuff?' cried Mr. Smoothed away. "'You observe this convenient bridge. "'We obtained a sufficient foundation for it by throwing into the slough some editions of books of morality, "'volumes of French philosophy and German rationalism, "'tracts, sermons, and essays of modern clergymen, "'extracts from Plato, Confucius, and various Hindu sages.' together with a few ingenious commentaries upon texts of scripture, all of which by some scientific process have been converted into mass like granite. The whole bog might be filled up with similar matter. It really seemed to me, however, that the bridge vibrated and heaved up and down in a very formidable manner, and in spite of Mr. Smoothed Away's testimony to the solidity of its foundation, I should be loath to cross it in a crowded omnibus especially if each passenger were encumbered with as heavy as luggage as that gentleman and myself. Nevertheless, we got over without accident and soon found ourselves at the station house. This very neat and spacious edifice is erected on the site of the little wicket gate, which formerly, as all old pilgrims will recollect, stood directly across the highway, and by its inconvenient narrowness was a great obstruction to the traveller of liberal mind and expansive stomach. The reader of John Bunyan will be glad to know, that Christian's old friend Evangelist, who was accustomed to supply each pilgrim with a mystic roll, now presides at the ticket office. Some malicious persons, it's true, deny the identity of this reputable character with the Evangelist of old times, and even pretend to bring competent evidence of an imposture. Without involving myself in a dispute, I shall merely observe that so far as my experience goes, the square pieces of pasteboard now delivered to passengers are much more convenient and useful along the road than the antique roll of parchment. Whether they'll be as readily received at, at the gate of the celestial city, why well, decline in giving an opinion. A large number of passengers were already at the station house, awaiting the departure of cars. By the aspect and demeanor of these persons, it was easy to judge that the feelings of the community had undergone a very favorable change in reference to the celestial pilgrimage. It would have done Bunyan's heart good to see it, instead of a lonely and ragged man with a huge burden on his back, plodding along sorrowfully on foot while the whole city hooted after him, here were parties of the first gentry and most respectable people in the neighborhood, setting forth towards the celestial city as cheerfully as if the pilgrimage were ne merely a summer tour. Among the gentlemen were characters of deserved eminence, magistrates, politicians, and men of wealth by whose example religion could not be but greatly recommended to their meaner brethren. In the ladies' apartment, too, I rejoice to distinguish some of those flowers of fashionable society, who are so well fitted to adorn the most elevated circles of the celestial city. 
there was much pleasant conversation about the news of the day. Topics of business, politics, or the lighter matters of amusement. While religion, though indubitably the main thing at heart, was thrown tastefully into the background. Even an infidel would have heard little or nothing to shock his sensibility. One great convenience of the new method of going on pilgrimage I must not forget to mention. Our enormous burdens, instead of being carried on our shoulders, as had been the custom of old, were all snugly deposited in the baggage car, and, as I was assured, would be delivered to the respective owners at the journey's end. Another thing, likewise, was the benevolent reader will be delighted to understand, and may be remembered that there was an ancient feud between the Prince Beelzebub and the keeper of the wicket gate, and that the adherents of the former distinguished personage were accustomed to shoot deadly arrows at honest pilgrims while knocking at the door. This dispute, much to the credit of the illustrious potentate, above mentioned as of the worthy and enlightened directors of the railroad, has been passed pacifically arranged, on the principle of mutual compromise. The prince's subjects are now pretty numerously employed about the station house, some in taking care of the baggage, others in collecting fuel, feeding the engines, and such congenial occupations. And I can consciously affirm that persons more attentive to their business, or more willing to accommodate, or more generally agreeable to the passengers, are not to be found on any railroad. Every good heart must surely exult at so satisfactorily an arrangement of an immemorial difficulty. Where is Mr. Greatheart? inquired I. Beyond a doubt, the directors have engaged that famous old champion to be chief conductor on the railroad. Why, no said Mr. Smoothed away with a dry cough. He was offered the situation of a brakeman. But to tell you the truth, our friend Greatheart has grown preposterously stiff and narrow in his old age. He has so often guided pilgrims over the road, on foot, that he considers it a sin to travel in any other fashion. Besides, the old fellow had entered so heartily into the ancient feud with Prince Beelzebub that he would have been perpetually at blows, or ill language with some of the prince's subjects and thus have embroiled us anew. So on the whole, we were not sorry when honest great heart went off to the celestial city in a huff, and left us at liberty to choose a more suitable and accommodating man. Yonder comes the conductor of the train. You will probably recognize him at once. The engine of this moment took its station in advance of the cars. Looking, I must confess, much like a sort of mechanical demon that would hurry us to the infernal regions, than a laudable contrivance for smoothing our way to the celestial city. On its top sat a personage almost enveloped in smoke and flame, which, not to startle the reader, appeared to gush from his own mouth and stomach, as well from the engine's brazen abdomen. "'Do my eyes deceive me?' cried I. "'What on earth is this, a living creature? "'If so, he is his own brother to the engine he rides upon.' <laughs> "'You are obtuse,' said Mr. Smoothed away with a hearty laugh. Don't you know Apollyon, Christian's old enemy, with whom he fought so fierce a battle in the Valley of Humiliation? He was the very fellow to manage the engine. So we have reconciled him to the custom of going on pilgrimage, and engaged him as the chief conductor. <laughs> bravo! Bravo! exclaimed I with irrepressible enthusiasm. This shows the liberality of the age. This proves, if anything can, that all musty prejudices are in a fair way to be obliterated. And how will Christian rejoice to hear of this happy transformation of his old antagonist? I promise myself great pleasure in informing him of it, when we reach the celestial city. The passengers being all comfortably seated, we now rattled away merrily, accomplishing a greater distance in ten minutes than Christian probably trudged over in a day. It was laughable while we glanced along, as it were, at the tail of a thunderbolt, to observe two dusty foot-travelers in the old pilgrim guise, with cockle shell and staff, their mystic rolls of parchment in their hands, and their intolerable burdens on their backs. The preposterous obstinacy of these honest people, in persisting to groan and stumble along the difficult pathway, rather than take advantage of modern improvements, excited great mirth among our wiser brotherhood. We greeted the two pilgrims with many pleasant jibes, and a roar of laughter, whereupon they gazed at us with such, such woeful, absurdly compassionate visages that our merriment grew tenfold more obstreperous. Apollyon also entered heartily into the fun and contrived to flirt the smoke and flame of the engine, 
with his own breath into their faces and enveloped them in an atmosphere of scalding steam. These little practical jokes amused us mightily, and doubtless afforded the pilgrims the gratification of considering themselves martyrs. At some distance from the railroad, Mr. Smoothed away pointed to a large antique edifice, which he observed was a tavern of long standing, and had formerly been a noted stopping place for pilgrims. In Bunyan's road book it is mentioned as the interpreter's house. Well, I've had a long curiosity to visit that old mansion, remarked I. It is not one of our stations, as you perceive, said my companion. The keeper was violently opposed to the railroad, and, well, he might be, as the track left his house of entertainment on one side, and thus was pretty certain to deprive him of all of his reputable customers. But the footpath still passes his door, and the old gentleman now and then receives a call from some simple traveler and entertains him with a fare as old-fashioned as himself. Before our talk on this subject came to a conclusion, we were rushing by the place where Christian's burdens fell from his shoulders at the side of the cross. This served as a theme for Mr. Soothed Away, Mr. Live for the World, Mr. Hyde Sin in the Heart, Mr. Scaly Conscience, and a knot of gentlemen from the town of Shun. Repentance to descant upon the inestimable advantages resulting from the safety of our baggage. Myself and all the passengers, indeed, joined with great unanimity of this view of the matter, for our burdens were rich and many things esteemed precious throughout the world. And, especially, we each of us possessed a great variety of favorite habits, which we trusted would not be out of fashion, even in the polite circles of the celestial city. It would have been a sad spectacle to see such an assortment of valuable articles tumbling into the sepulchre. Thus pleasantly conversing on the favorable circumstances of our positions, as compared with those of vast pilgrims, and of narrow-minded ones at the present day, we soon found ourselves at the foot of the hill difficulty. Through the very heart of this rocky mountain, a tunnel has been constructed of the most admirable architecture, with a lofty arch and a spacious double track, so that unless the earth and rock should chance to crumble down, it will remain an eternal monument of the builder's skill and enterprise. It is a great, though incidental, advantage that the materials from the heart of the hill difficulty have been employed in filling up the valley of humiliation, thus obviating the necessity of descending into that disagreeable and unwholesome hollow. Well, this is a wonderful improvement indeed, said I. Yet I should have been glad of an opportunity to visit the palace beautiful and be introduced to the charming young ladies, Miss Prudence, Miss Piety, Miss Charity, and the rest who have the kindness to entertain pilgrims there. "'Young ladies!' cried Mr. Smoothed away as soon as you could speak for laughing. "'And charming young ladies! Why, my dear fellow, they're old maids, every soul of them. Prim, starched, dry, and angular. And not one of them, I will venture to say, has altered so much as the fashion of her gown since, well, since the days of the Christian's pilgrimage.' "'Ah, well,' I said, much comforted. "'Then I can very readily dispense with their acquaintance.' The respectable Apollyon was now putting on the steam at a prodigious rate, anxious perhaps to get rid of the unpleasant reminiscences of the connected with the spot which he had so disastrously encountered Christian. Consulting Mr. Bunyan's road book, I perceived we must now be within a few miles of the valley of the shadow of death, into which doleful region at our present speed we should plunge much sooner than seemed at all desirable. In truth, I expected nothing better than to find myself in the ditch on one side or the quay on the other. But on communicating my apprehensions to Mr. Smoothed away, he assured me that the difficulties of this passage, even its worst condition, had been vastly exaggerated, and that in its present state of improvement I might consider myself as safe as on any railroad in Christendom. Even while we were speaking, the train shot into the entrance of this dreaded valley. Though I plead guilty to some foolish palpitations of the heart, during our headlong rush over the causeway here constructed, yet it were unjust to withhold the highest encomiums of the boldness of its original conception and the ingenuity of those who executed it. It was gratifying likewise to observe how much care had been taken to dispel the everlasting gloom and supply the defect of cheerful sh sunshine, not a ray of which has ever penetrated among these awful shadows. For this purpose, the inflammable gas which exudes plentifully from the soil is collected by means of pipes, and thence communicated to a quadruple row of lamps, among the whole extent of the passage. Thus a radiance has been created, 
even out of the fiery and sulfurous curse that rests forever upon the valley. A radiance hurtful, however, to the eyes, and somewhat bewildering as I discovered by the changes which had wrought in the visages of my companions. In this respect, as I compared with natural daylight, there is the same difference as between truth and falsehood. But if the reader has ever traveled through the dark valley, he'll have learned to be thankful for any light he can get. If not from the sky above, then from the blasted soil beneath. Such was the red brilliancy of these lamps that they appeared to build walls of fire on both sides of the track, between which we held our course at lightning speed, while a reverberating thunder filled the valley with its echoes. Had the engine run off the track, a catastrophe, it is whispered, by no means unprecedented. The bottomless pit, if there be any such place, would undoubtedly have received us. Just as some dismal fooleries of this nature had made my heart quake, there came a tremendous shriek. Careering along the valleys of a thousand devils had burst their lungs to utter it, but which proved to be merely a whistle of the engine, arriving at a stopping place. The spot where we now paused is that same as our friend Bunyan. Truthful man, but infected with many fantastic notions, has designated in terms plainer than I like to repeat as the mouth of the infernal region. This, however, must be a mistake. Inasmuch as Mr. Smooth it away while we remained in the smoky and lurid cavern, took occasion to prove that Tophet has not even a metaphorical existence. The place, he assured us, is no other than the crater of a half-extinct volcano, in which the directors had caused forges to be set up for the manufacture of railroad iron. Hence also has obtained a plentiful supply of fuel for the use of the engines. Whoever had gazed into the dismal obscurity of the broad cavern mouth, whence ever and anon darted huge tongues of dusky flame, and had seen the strange half-shaped monsters and visions of faces horribly grotesque, into which smoke seemed to wreathe itself, and had heard the awful murmurs and shrieks and deep shuddering whispers of the blast sometimes forming themselves into words almost articulate would have seized upon Mr. Smooth it away's comfortable explanation as greedily as we did. The inhabitants of the cavern, moreover, were unlovely personages, dark and smoke-begrimed, generally deformed with misshapen feet and a glow of dusky redness in their eyes, as if their hearts had caught fire and were blazing out of the upper windows. It struck me as a peculiarity that their laborers at the forge and those who brought fuel to the engine when they began to draw short breath positively emitted smoke from their mouths and nostrils. Among the idlers about the train, most of whom were puffing cigars, which they had lighted at the flame of the crater, I was perplexed to notice several, who to my certain knowledge had heretofore set forth by railroad for the celestial city. They looked wild and smoky with a singular resemblance, indeed, to the native inhabitants, like whom, all they also had a disagreeable propensity to ill-natured jibes and sneers, the habit of which had wrought a settled contortion of their visages. Having been on speaking terms with one of these persons, an indolent good-for-nothing fellow who went by the name of Take It Easy, I called him and inquired what was his business there. Did you not start, said I, for the celestial city? Well, that's a fact, said Mr. Take It Easy, carelessly puffing on some smoke into my eyes. But I heard such bad accounts that I never took pains to climb the hill on which the city stands. No business doing, no fun going on, nothing to drink and no smoking allowed, and a thrumming of church music from morning till night. I would not stay in such a place if they offered me house room and living free. But, my good Mr. Take It Easy, cried I, why take up your residence here of all places in the world? Oh, said the loafer with a grin, it is very warm hereabouts, and I meet with plenty of old acquaintances, and altogether the place suits me. I hope to see you back again some day soon. Pleasant journey to you. While he was speaking, the bell of the engine rang and we dashed away, after dropping a few passengers but receiving no new ones. Rattling onward through the valley, we were dazzled with the fiercely gleaming gas lamps as before. But sometimes in the dark intense brightness, grim faces that bore the aspect and expression of individual sins or evil passions seemed to thrust themselves through the veil of light glaring upon us and stretching forth a great dusky hand as if to impede our progress. I almost thought they were my own sins that appalled me there. These were freaks of imagination. Nothing more, certainly. Mere delusions which I ought heartily to be ashamed of. But all through the dark valley I was tormented and pestered and dolefully bewildered with the same kind of waking dreams. 
The mephitic gases of that region intoxicate the brain. As the light of natural day, however, began to struggle with the glow of the lanterns, these vain imaginations lost their vividness and finally vanished with the first ray of sunshine that greeted our escape from the valley of the shadow of death. Ere we'd gone a mile beyond it, I could well nigh have taken my oath that this whole gloomy passage was a dream. At the end of the valley, as John Bunyan mentions, is a cavern where, in his days, dwelt two cruel giants, Pope and Pagan, who had strewn the ground about their residence with the bones of slaughtered pilgrims. These vile old troglodytes are no longer there. But in their deserted cave, another terrible giant has thrust himself and makes his business to seize upon honest travelers and fat them for his table with plentiful meals of smoke, mist, moonshine, raw potatoes, and sawdust. He is a giant by birth and is called Giant Transcendentalist. But as to his form and his features and substance and his nature generally, it is the chief peculiarity of this huge miscreant that neither he for himself nor anybody for him has ever been able to describe them. As we rushed by the cavern's mouth, we caught a hasty glimpse of him, looking somewhat like an ill-proportioned figure, but considerably more like a heap of fog and duskiness. He shouted after us, but in so strange a phraseology that we knew not what he meant, nor whether to be encouraged or affrighted. It was late in the day when the train thundered into the ancient city of Vanity, where Vanity Fair is still at the height of prosperity and exhibits an epitome of whatever is brilliant, gay, and fascinating beneath the sun. As I proposed to make a considerable stay here, it gratified me to learn that there is no longer the want of harmony between the townspeople and pilgrims, which impelled the former to such lamentably mistaken measures as the persecution of Christian and the fiery martyrdom of faithful. On the contrary, as the new railroad brings with it great trade and constant influx of strangers, the lord of Vanity Fair, its chief patron, and the capitalists of the city are among the largest stockholders. Many passengers stop to take their pleasure or make their profit in the fair, instead of going onwards towards the celestial city. Indeed, such are the charms of the place that people often affirm it to be the true and only heaven, stoutly contending that there's no other, that those who seek further are mere dreamers and that if the fabled brightness of the celestial city lay but a bare mile beyond the gates of vanity, they would not be fools enough to go thither. Without subscribing to these perhaps exaggerated encomiums, I can truly say that my abode in the city was mainly agreeable, and my intercourse with the inhabitants productive of much amusement and instruction. Being naturally of a serious turn, my attention was directed to the solid advantages derivable from a residence here, rather than to the effervescent pleasures which are the grand object with too many visitants. The Christian reader, if he has no accounts of the city later than Bunyan's time, may be surprised to hear that almost every street has its church, and that the reverend clergy are nowhere held in higher respect than at Vanity Fair. And well do they deserve such honorable estimation, for the maxims of wisdom and virtue which fall from their lips come from as deep a spiritual source and tend to as lofty a religious aim as those of the sagest philosophers of old. In justification of this high praise, I need only mention the names of the Reverend Mr. Shallow Deep, the Reverend Mr. Stumble at Truth, and the fine old cler clerical character, the Reverend Mr. This Today, who expects shortly to resign his pulpit to the Reverend Mr. That Tomorrow, together with the Reverend Mr. Bewilderment and the Reverend Mr. Clog the Spirit and the last and greatest, the Reverend Dr. Wind of Doctrine. The labors of these eminent divines are aided by those of innumerable lecturers who diffuse such various profundity in all subjects of human or celestial science that any man may acquire omnigenous erudition with the trouble of even learning to read. Thus literature is etherealized by assuming for its medium the human voice, and knowledge depositing all its heavier particles except doubtless its gold, becomes exhaled into a sound which forthwith steals into the ever-open ear of the community. These ingenious methods constitute a sort of machinery by which thought and study are done to every person's hand without his putting himself to the slightest inconvenience in the matter. There is another species of machine for the wholesale manufacture of the individual morality. This excellent result is affected by societies of all manner of virtuous purposes, with which a man has merely to connect himself, throwing, as it were, his quota of virtue into the common stock. And the president and directors will take care that the aggregate amount will be well applied. 
all of these and other wonderful improvements in ethics, religion, and literature being made plain to my comprehension by the ingenious Mr. Smooth It Away inspired me with a vast admiration of Vanity Fair. It would fill a volume in an age of pamphlets were I to record all my observations in this great capital of human business and pleasure. There was an unlimited range of society, the powerful, the wise, the witty, the philanthropists, all making their own market at the fair, and deeming no price too exorbitant for such commodities as hit their fancy. It was well worth one while, even if he had no idea of buying or selling, to loiter through the bazaars and observe the various sorts of traffic that were going forward. Some of the purchasers, I thought, made very foolish bargains. For instance, a young man having inherited a splendid fortune laid out a considerable portion of it in the purchase of diseases, and finally spent all the rest for a heavy lot of repentance and a suit of rags. A very pretty girl bartered a heart as clear as crystal, in which seemed most valuable possession for another jewel of the same kind, but it was so worn and defaced as to be utterly worthless. In one shop there was a great many crowns of laurel and myrtle which soldiers Authors, statesmen, and various other great people pressed eagerly to buy. Some purchased these paltry wreaths with their lives, others by a toilsome servitude of years, and many sacrificed whatever is most valuable, yet finally slunk away without the crown. There is a sort of stock or scrip called conscience which seemed to be in great demand and would purchase almost anything. Indeed, few rich commodities were to be obtained without paying a heavy sum in this particular stock, and the man's business was seldom very lucrative, unless he knew precisely when and how to throw this hoard of conscience into the market. Yet as the stock was the only thing of permanent value, whoever parted with it was sure to find himself a loser in the long run. Several of the speculations were of a questionable character. Occasionally a member of Congress recruited his pocket by the sale of his constituents, and I was assured that public officers have often sold their country at very moderate prices. Thousands sold their happiness for a whim. Gilded chains are in great demand and purchased with almost any sacrifice. In truth, those who desired, according to their old adage, to sell anything valuable for a song might find customers all over the fair, and there were innumerable messages of pottage piping hot for such as chose to buy them with their birthrights. A few articles, however, cannot be found genuine at Vanity Fair. If a customer wished to renew his stock of youth, the dealers offered him a set of false teeth and an auburn wig. If he demanded a peace of mind, they recommended opium or a brandy bottle. Tracts of land and golden mansions situate in the celestial city were often exchanged at very disadvantageous prices for a few years' lease of small and dismal inconvenient tenements in Vanity Fair. Prince Beelzebub himself took great interest in this sort of traffic and sometimes condescended to meddle with smaller matters. I once had the pleasure to see him bargaining with a miser for his soul, which after much ingenious skirmishing on both sides, his highness succeeded in obtaining at about the value of a sixpence. The prince remarked with a smile that he was a loser by the transaction. Day after day as I walked the streets of vanity, my manners and deportment became more and more like those of the inhabitants. The place began to seem like home. The idea of pursuing my travels to the celestial city was almost obliterated from my mind. I was reminded of it, however, by the sight of the same pair of simple pilgrims at whom we laughed so heartily when Apollyon puffed smoke and steam into their faces at the commencement of our journey. There they stood amid the densest bustle of vanity, the dealers offering them their purple and fine linen and jewels, the men of wit and humor jibing at them, a pair of buxom ladies ogling them askance, while the benevolent Mr. Smoothed Away whispered some of his wisdom at their elbows and pointed to a newly erected temple. But there were these worthy simpletons, making the scene look wild and monstrous, merely by their sturdy repudiation of all part in its business or pleasures. One of them, his name was perceived in my face, I suppose, a species of th sympathy and almost admiration, which to my own great surprise I could not help feeling for this pragmatic couple. It prompted him to address me. Sir, inquired he with a sad yet mild and kindly voice, do you call yourself a pilgrim? Well, yes, I replied. My right to that appellation is indubitable. I am merely a sojourner here in Vanity Fair, being bound to the celestial city by the new railroad. Well, alas, friend, rejoined Mr. Stick to the right, I do assure you and beseech you to receive the truth of my words that that whole concern is a bubble. You may travel on it all your lifetime were you to live thousands of years, 
and yet never get beyond the limits of Vanity Fair. Yea, though you should deem yourself entering the gates of the blessed city, it will be nothing but a miserable delusion. The Lord of the Celestial City, began the other pilgrim, whose name was Mr. Footed to Heaven, has refused and will ever refuse to grant an act of incorporation for this railroad, and unless that be obtained, no passenger can ever hope to enter his dominions. Wherefore, every man who buys a ticket must lay his account with losing the purchase money, which is the value of his own soul. Puh! Nonsense, said Mr. Smooth it away, taking my arm and leading me off. These fellows ought to be indicted for a libel. If the law stood as it once did in Vanity Fair, we should see them grinning through the iron bars of the prison window. This incident made a considerable impression on my mind, and contributed with other circumstances to indispose me to a permanent residence in the city of Vanity. Although, of course, I was not simple enough to give up my original plan of gliding along easily and commodiously by railroad, still I grew anxious to be gone. There was one strange thing that troubled me. Amid the occupations or amusements of the fair, nothing was more common than for a person, whether at a feast, a theater, or church, or trafficking for wealth and honors, or whatever he might be doing, and however unseasonable the interruption, suddenly to vanish like a soap bubble, and never more be seen of his fellows. And so accustomed were the latter to such little accidents, that they went on with their business as quietly as if nothing had happened. But it was otherwise with me. Finally, after a pretty long residence at the fair, I resumed my journey towards the celestial city with Mr. Smooth it away still by my side. At a short distance beyond the suburbs of Vanity, we passed the ancient silver mine of which Damas was the first discoverer, and which is now wrought to a great advantage, supplying nearly all the quaint currency of the world. A little further onward was a spot where Lot's wife had stood for ages, under the semblance of a pillar of salt. Curious travelers have long since carried it away piecemeal. Had all regrets been punished as rigorously as this poor dame's were, my yearning for the relinquished delights of Vanity Fair might have produced a similar change in my own corporeal substance, and left me a warning to future pilgrims. The next and remarkable object was a large edifice constructed of moss-grown stone, but in a modern and airy style of architecture. The engine came to a pause in its vicinity with the usual tremendous shriek. This was formerly the castle of a redoubted giant despair, observed Mr. Smoothedway. But since his death, Mr. Flimsy Faith has repaired it, and now keeps an excellent house of entertainment here. It is one of our stopping places. It seems but slightly put together, remarked I, looking at the frail yet ponderous walls. I do not envy Mr. Flimsy Faith his habitation. Some day it will thunder down upon the heads of the occupants. We shall escape at all events, said Mr. Smoothedway for Apollyon is putting on the steam again. The road now plunged into a gorge of the delectable mountains and traversed the field where in former ages the blind men wandered and stumbled among the tombs. One of these ancient tombstones had been thrust across the track by some malicious person and gave the train of cars a terrible jolt. Far up the rugged side of a mountain I perceived a rusty iron door, half overgrown with bushes and creeping plants, but with smoke issuing from its crevices. Is that, I inquired I, the very door in the hillside which the shepherds assured Christian was a byway to hell? Well, that was a joke on the part of the shepherds, said Mr. Smooth it away with a smile. It is neither more nor less than the door of a cave, which they use as a smokehouse for the preparation of mutton hams. My recollections of the journey are now, for a little space, dim and confused, inasmuch as singular drowsiness here overcame me. Owing to the fact that we are passing over the enchanted ground, the air which encourages a disposition to sleep. I awoke, however, as soon as we crossed the borders of the pleasant land of Beulah. All the passengers were rubbing their eyes, comparing watches, and congratulating one another on the prospect of arriving so seasonably at the journey's end. The sweet breezes of this happy clime came refreshingly to our nostrils. We beheld the glimmering gush of silver fountains, overhung by trees of beautiful foliage and delicious fruit, which were propagated by grafts from the celestial gardens. Once as we dashed onward like a hurricane, there was a flutter of wings and the bright appearance of an angel in the air speeding forth on some heavenly mission. The engine now announced the close vicinity of the final station house, by one last and horrible scream in which there seemed to be distinguishable every kind of wailing and woe and bitter fierceness of wrath all mixed up with the wild laughter of a devil or a madman. Throughout our journey, at every stopping place, 
appalling had exercised his ingenuity in screwing the most abominable sounds out of the whistle of the steam engine. But in this closing effort he outdid himself, and created an infernal uproar, which besides disturbing the peaceful inhabitants of Beulah, must have sent its discord even through the celestial gates. While the horrid clamor was still ringing in our ears, we heard an exulting strain as if a thousand instruments of music with height and depth and sweetness in their tones at once tender and triumphant were struck in unison to greet the approach of some illustrious hero who had fought the good fight and won a glorious victory and was come to lay aside his battered arms forever. Looking to ascertain what might be the occasion of this glad harmony, I perceived on the lighting from the cars that a multitude of shining ones had assembled on the other side of the river to welcome two poor pilgrims who were just emerging from its depths. They were the same whom Apollyon and ourselves had persecuted with jaunts, taunts and jibes, and scalding steam at the commencement of our journey, the same whose unworldly aspect and impressive words had stirred my conscience amid the wild revelers of Vanity Fair. "'How amazingly well those men have gotten on!' cried I to Mr. Smoothedway. "'I wish we were secure of as good a reception.' "'Never fear! Never fear!' answered my friend. Come, make haste. The ferry boat will be off directly, and in three minutes you'll be on the other side of the river. No doubt you will find coaches to carry you up to the city gates. A steam ferry boat, the last improvement on this important route, lay at the riverside, puffing and snorting and emitting all those other disagreeable utterances which betoken the departure to the immediate. I hurried on board with the rest of the passengers, most of whom were in great peturation some bawling out for their baggage and some tearing their hair and exclaiming that the boat would explode or sink, some already pale with the heaving of the stream, some gazing affrighted at the ugly aspect of the steersman, and some still dizzy with the slumberous influences of the enchanted ground. Looking back to the shore, I was amazed to discern Mr. Smoothed away waving his hand at a token of farewell. "'Well, don't you go over to the Celestial City?' exclaimed I. "'Oh, no,' answered he with a queer smile that same disagreeable contortion of visage which I had remarked in the inhabitants of the Dark Valley. Oh, no, I have come thus far only for the sake of your pleasant company. Goodbye. We shall meet again. And then did my excellent friend Mr. Smoothed away laugh outright, in the midst of which cachinnation a smoke wreath hissed from his mouth and nostrils, while a twinkle of lurid flame darted out of either eye, proving indubitably that his heart was all of red blaze. The impudent fiend! To deny the existence of Tophet when he felt his fiery tortures ra raging within his breast? Why, well, flushed to the side of the boat, intending to fling myself on shore. But the wheels as they began the revolutions threw a dash of spray over me, so cold, so deadly cold, with the chill that will never leave those waters until death be drowned in his own river, that with a shiver and a heartquake I awoke. Thank heaven. It was a dream.